always say I don't want to create bourbon from a boardroom. You know, I've got a thirst for uh, seeing what's around the next corner. I've had a saying since I've been 15 years old. I need the miles. And the bumpier the road, the steeper the climb, all the better. You know what, it's probably because Mother Nature is, it's the ultimate laboratory. That's where I like to be. That's where my workshop is. If I'm outside, I'm happy. Hey, what's going on? All good, all good. Six take one marker. Life is good. Oh, in the early days, we had a number of challenges, but the biggest issue we had then, nobody drank bourbon. To go back to like starting the brand of Jefferson's to begin with, that's the least safe play you can make in American whiskey. The 1990s was a time of, if you went to a bank and you said, hey, I want to start a whiskey brand, they would have laughed you out of the room so fast because there was no money there. And the fact is, this industry is not very friendly to newcomers. There were only eight distilleries at the time, and bourbon was in a 30-year decline, so that made this ocean of bourbon available because they couldn't sell it, it was either being blended into a four-year-old bourbon and not being showcased, or it was evaporating off until there was nothing left of it. So when I went knocking on the doors and talking to the different distilleries, they were more than happy to sell me as much bourbon as I wanted. Trey came to us, a, a, a group of, of friends, and, and he said, I'm gonna start a, a bourbon. Not only am I gonna start a bourbon, but I'm gonna start a premium bourbon. So we thought he was crazy, but we were loved him and we wanted to support him, and, and that's what we all tried to do. I think the key back when my dad and I started out is we were trying to make friends with bottles. You've got to have someone who thinks about numbers, who thinks about protecting the business, and that's Chet. And then you got to have someone who is like the charismatic out there being different spokesperson. That's Trey. I was 28 years old when we started. It was going out and just beating the streets. I was on the road a lot. I was meeting new distributors, opening up new distributors. I got to know people. I got to know what people liked, what they were looking for, what they connected to. It took a good 10 years before the tide really started to turn and people wanted for those were some lean, lean years. We did not sell much whiskey at all. That made a lot more fun. It's like anything else. The more you have to struggle, the more you appreciate it. Trey, we got to see you. The best part of the 25 years of Jefferson's, without a doubt, is doing it with my dad. Having that time together, to be able to travel where we have together, and to be able to do it with him has been my wildest dream come true. There's some gems in this stuff right here. Been a long time. I actually had hair back then. What happened? <laughs> so did I. I haven't seen these in years. Some of the first whiskey fest. You remember they used to stick us in the corner? We were the stepchild. Yeah, for sure. We weren't exactly welcomed into the uh, bourbon community not, with open arms. Not at that time, <laughs> right? I just quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> I had put everything into this, and I couldn't sleep. That was some crazy stuff back then. We were kind of short on funds at the time, but we had to scrape together to, to, go to continue ahead on. Today, we've got 21 different expressions of Jefferson's bourbon. And still, Jefferson's very small batch and Jefferson's reserve are two of my favorite to craft. 
because the success that we achieved by producing this quintessential approachable bourbon that everyone can appreciate, that success gave me the confidence and credibility to reach out to different experts in different fields so I could collaborate with them and work together to push bourbons in different directions by grabbing Cabernet barrels from the Chapelet to make our Pritchard Hill cast finish, or rum barrels from Gosling's to make our rum cast finish, or different cognac barrels. It really allowed us to push the boundaries of what bourbon can be. So we went down to Costa Rica for uh, a number of our 40th birthdays. We went down there to surf, catch some fish. We were having a blast. At the end of the day, every night on the bow of the ship, we started drinking bourbon. That ship's rocking back and forth, and it's rocking that bourbon back and forth in the glass. And that's when I thought, if this is happening in the bottle, it certainly would happen in a barrel. And if it would happen in a barrel, it's gonna force maturation. So I suggested, why don't we put some barrels on the ship? So as these barrels travel, they zigzag the globe. So you're crossing the equator, you're getting all types of different weather fluctuations, temperature changes, the sun's beating down on those barrels, they're getting rained upon, snowed upon, they're hitting named storms all the time, they hit dead seas. You're getting all this influence that you couldn't possibly get inside of a warehouse like we are right now. After three and a half years, we headed down to Key West to taste the barrels. I've never had it before. I've got three journalists with me. I'm hoping it's good, but I don't know. I thought Trey was absolutely crazy for doing Ocean at first. They sent me a, a little sample, and I think I still have it. I don't know where it is, but they sent it to me, and it was like, it was like damn near black. And I think I called Trey up, and I was like, did you guys leave a nail in this whiskey or something? So we tap in, and it comes out black, and it comes out thick. And I'm thinking, oh, no. Oh, no, I've got these guys down here. But then we tasted it. And it just covered our tongue and the flavors. It was so viscous and so caramely. The salt just, just resonated throughout. It was delicious. And it went down so easy. It was like no bourbon I'd ever had before. It really inspired me to see what else we could do with it. You know, where shall it go from here? Hey, Max, I think we, we can build a, a cage for these barrels to ship them. OK. So if you could weld something. Trey is very much a visionary. Put a latch on it, or yeah. not a latch, but a hook on it. He doesn't want to do the same old, same old, same old, same old. You know, he wants to do something different. Today, we've got about 100 different experiments going on at all times. So we've got one in Montana. Trey has barrels all over the world, I think. <laughs> we've got one in Arkansas, which is in the Delta. In mountains, they're in rivers. We've got one right off the Chesapeake. There's one on a wagon on a ranch, just bouncing around the back, <laughs> back of that wagon. After I saw the transformation that the bourbon made when we put it on the ocean voyages, it made me think, why did bourbon proliferate in Kentucky and not elsewhere? I had a hypothesis that it was the route to market that that whiskey took, changing it from whiskey to bourbon for the first time. So we decided to recreate that. I called it Jefferson's Journey. We floated two barrels down to New Orleans. It took us 58 days. Then we put it on ships and sent it down to Tampa, Key West, Fort Lauderdale, and finally hitchhiking up the East Coast to New York. What happened to that whiskey on that voyage? I tell you what, it turned out unbelievable. It was as dark as a 16-year-old that we double-barreled. It was so easy drinking, it turned out delicious. The experiment took a full year to complete. We already knew that aging on the water had a material impact on the bourbon. But I wanted proof. So we sent it to a lab to break it down molecularly. And I got a 300-page document telling me exactly how it changes. 
I had a hard time making heads or tails of it. This is Trey Zoller with Jefferson's Bourbon. How are we doing today? I'm doing fine. Thank you, Trey. It's Anthony from Geordie Labs. We received your, your sample and your control. Um, at the same time, we treated them the same. So the differences we are seeing, the, the main finding was that the, the whiskey that had been on the journey had more of these uh, aromatic compounds, uh, ester compounds, ketones, uh, families of compounds that would generally be uh, attributed to flavors and aromas. Fantastic. Well, that just back When you take the barrels out of the control by changing the environment and the agitation of the maturation, you completely change the result and what you're going to get out of it. You ready to get a barrel? Really? You ready to get a barrel? Let's go get that barrel. He's saying smack me in the face. <laughs> yeah. You know, you've always got a little bit of trepidation when you go back to taste one of these experiments. You're building it up, you're talking about it, and you know, with your buddies who are ripping you, saying this isn't gonna do a damn thing, or this, you know, what a waste of effort. Then you go in there and you, you're wrestling around with that barrel, trying to get it just right before you're able to, to jockey it back onto the boat. When you're drilling into those barrels, you don't know what to expect. But when you start to see that color shooting out, and you can see that it just looks a little bit thicker than it used to be, and then when you try it, and you can tell that it's really morphed into something different, that's when you get a big smile on your face and like, all right, this is working. Thank you all very much. I'm one of the lucky people that absolutely loves what I do. I love the opportunity that it affords me to go to some incredible places and uh, work with some incredible people. In, in a way, what I'm doing is self-serving. I'm trying to make great whiskey, but I'm trying to have a damn good time while I'm doing it. Um, 